Hi, friends, and welcome to Saturday at 2.30, the video podcast I do here on Facebook Live every Saturday at 2.30 Central Time, and later putting it up on my YouTube channel. Uh, I always touch upon some theme of uh, hypnotism or the hip uh, spirituality uh, or life coaching, as those that's what I do for a living. Today I want to talk about a request that I received from someone who's a fan. The request was, how did you become a hypnotist? So I decided that would be a fun short video to make. Got another request from another uh, another Facebook friend. How did you become a minister? So I'm going to do that next week. This is about hypnosis. When I was 10 years old, I saw Orman McGill perform his concert of hypnotism on what he would later tell me was the Art Link Letter Show. Um, I remember it as being the Bob Hope Show, but he said it couldn't have been. It had to be the Art Link Letter Show. But I was so fascinated by that that I saved up quarters from my allowance and I sent away for my very first book on hypnotism, which was advertised in the back of Superman comic books. The... Um, uh, the ad, some of you in my generation may remember it. You had this guy who looked a lot like Orman McGill in a tuxedo standing over this woman in a skin-tight gown that she had obviously put on using a brush and a roller, and she's lying on a couch, and he's waving his hands, and there are lightning bolts coming out of his fingers. Uh, I would later discover from one of Orman McGill's uh, closest friends, Shelley Stockwell, that actually Orman did create that graphic, which is kind of neat. So I sent away for this book, and it contained just enough information to get me in one heck of a lot of trouble. I often joke that hypnotists are born, not made. That is, if you have the hypnotic personality, it doesn't take a lot of information for you to become you know, really dangerous. And while the theory in the book uh, was kind of silly, mind control, the techniques are you know, the basic hypnotic techniques we teach today in the state-licensed hypnosis schools that many guild instructors run. So I did learn enough about how to hypnotize, because I apparently do have that kind of personality, that I was able to successfully hypnotize my grade school classmates into singing the Star Spangled Banner whenever the teacher turned her back to the class to erase the blackboard. Initially, everyone thought it was great fun until they figured out they couldn't stop. Then they all got scared. I was thrown out of school, uh, suspended. My... Uh, Parents forbade me to have anything further to do with hypnotism, and you see how well that worked. So I would, it would become my life's passion. I read everything I could get my, my hands on about how to hypnotize. I was growing up in a relatively small Connecticut town, and uh, the library had an age limit. You had to be 18 to use the adult library. But... I would go into use the junior library, which was okay, and then I would sneak downstairs to the stacks where the 100 level volumes were stored in the Dewey Decimal System. That's where the books on hypnosis are. And I would, would read anything I could find. And I read a number of the absolute classic texts, in fact, during that time. The Cron, Bordeaux, uh, a little bit of Erickson was all done about Erickson was all there. And the uh, I think the librarians knew what I was doing, but they left me alone because they you, know, you had this kid who was reading and they thought that was a good thing. When I would enter uh, food service, the culinary union, to become an apprentice uh, cook and later a chef, uh, I often would do hypnosis for my uh, coworkers. If they had to keep, keep themselves centered and focused to memorize complicated orders so the, uh, and to, to help the, the line crew not 
get into the weeds, as it's called, when you lose track of where you are in preparation. So focus, memorization, keeping your cool under pressure. I worked out simple hypnotic techniques using what I knew from my reading uh, to do this. Then I went off to college. Now, the University of Connecticut, where I got my first two degrees, had no offerings on hypnotism at all. But they did have a good library, and I could use any resource in that library as an enrolled student, and I read everything I could get my hands on. I would ultimately go to Meadville Lombard Theological School, which at the time was an affiliate of the University of Chicago, and we had University of Chicago IDs, and we could take or audit classes anywhere in the, uh, the University of Chicago system, including the School of Psychiatry. And the University of Chicago Medical Center had some of the foremost hypnotists in the world practicing, people like Erica Fromm. So I got to not study with, but at least listen to and read about some of the, because the, I could get to the bookstore and I could buy the books, uh, read about some of the, the very advanced techniques in hypnotism that were being worked out. After graduation, I joined the Chicago Psychological Association, which at the time would admit doctoral level members of the clergy. I don't think they do that anymore, but back then they did. In fact, I would become treasurer of the organization for a while. And at its uh, annual convention, there were workshops in how to do hypnosis, taught by leading psychiatrists and psychologists, and so I attended. Um, one of those practices, Associated Mental Health Services, was offering a training program with beginning, intermediate, and advanced levels, and I took that training program. I would ultimately then do a two-year mentorship with uh, one of the principals of that practice. Now, that psychologist has since become very important in the world of hypnotism, and as there is tension between uh, the members of the National Guild of Hypnotists and some of the psychological hypnotic practitioners, I don't want to say his name on a video, but uh, if he's listening or watching, hi Rick, I owe you dude, I really do. It was a great practice. I was a parish minister finishing up my training to become a board certified chaplain and to go into community ministry, which is what my form of hypnotic practice is called. And uh, so I would do hypnosis as part of my pastoral work with members of the congregation. My interest in cancer care began there because I had nine women in the congregation who had breast cancer. And they came to me and asked if I would do um, uh, hypnosis with them to deal with the side effects of their treatment. Now, there was no literature on how to do this. It was literally a matter of my making up the techniques as I went along. But all nine of those women did better than anyone thought that they would do. And so within a few years, their doctors wanted to send other patients, and gradually that just took over my career. In 1990, my denomination, which is the Unitarian Universalist Association, formally allowed members of its clergy not to work with parishes, but to work with a larger community as part of an extended uh, ministry called community ministry. And I immediately jumped to do that. I was one of the very first four ministers in my denomination credentialed to do work with a larger community and the work I did uh, was kind of a public chaplaincy specializing in medical hypnosis. And it goes on from there. There was a National Association of Clergy Hypnotherapists uh, uh, at the time, and I joined and would become one of its officers. This organization eventually merged with the National Guild of Hypnotists, and uh, i that's how I got into the be a member of the largest and oldest hypnosis organization in the world. The, um, also, there, were, there are a number of other hypnosis organizations around. Uh, uh, back then, a number of them were part of an organization called COPO, the Council of Professional Hypnosis Organizations. And uh, I was a representative 
to that would ultimately be elected as its president. And I served two years. Uh, so I got to know the profession from the inside out. When in the 1980s and 90s, we began to have certain psychological groups try to pass laws that say that only they could practice hypnosis, it was, it fell to me in the role that I was having then to take the point in going against, trying to prevent those laws from being passed, or in some cases, reversing or modifying them after they were passed. Uh, I was successful at that, whereupon Dwight Damon, who was the president of the National Guild of Hypnotists, called me and said, you know, there's no one else who knows more about how to do this than you are, so I want you as the legislation and governmental concerns person for the National Guild of Hypnotists. I agreed and was appointed to the advisory board, and I've carried that portfolio ever since. So that's how it began. That's how my practice uh, in medical hypnosis, now more than 30 years here in the Chicago area, has gone on. It has prospered from the moment I put my hand to it. I had a full-time practice in my first year. By year two, I had won my first national award. By year three, I was a national office where I've been ever since. I'm now almost 70 years old and kind of trying to cycle my practice down into a semi-retired practice that I can handle with my declining uh, energy and stamina. And I'm engaged in that work, but I'll never stop. I love doing hypnotists. And you talk to any successful hypnotist out there, I don't care what school of hypnotic thought they belong to or what organization they belong to. If they've been in practice for a while and they're successful, they're going to tell you the same thing I just did. We love it. We love the craft of the hypnotic arts and sciences. And there's nothing we would rather do. So I'm going to keep on keeping on. Orban McGill died in his late 90s. Uh, one of the awards I have is the Orman McGill Chair, which is given by the National Guild of Hypnotists. That's one of my prized possession, possessions because it brought my life kind of full circle. I got started because I saw Orman McGill. I would get to know Orman McGill. Uh, and after he died, I was re received the award that carries on his name. And I just think that's just a delightful kind of uh, synchronicity. The, uh, he kept on practicing until his 90s. He was seeing clients right up to the end. And that's what I hope to do, too. I can't imagine not being a hypnotist. So that's my story. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll be back next Saturday with talking about how I became a minister, for goodness sake. And uh, often it would be a joke at Guild board meetings when I would be talking about some complicated political strategy. Everyone would turn to me and say, are you sure you're a minister? Uh, yeah, I am. I'll talk about that next week. If I can be of help to you, feel, please feel free to reach out and to uh, like and share. Uh, these videos are one of the ways that people get to know me and my work and ideas. So, uh, Feel free to share them with anyone that you think might enjoy them. Take care, stay well, and stay safe.